So I hope you're all having as much fun as I am. Um, we've had some really interesting talks already this week, and hopefully I can add to that in a positive way. Out of curiosity, before I get started, I have a few questions for you. Um, how many of you have a Facebook account? How many of you have a Twitter account? A Flickr account? Google Plus? Yeah, I think we managed to get most of you one way or another somewhere in there. I'm not terribly surprised. Um, I actually have one of each of those myself. And um, it may well be the case that by the time we're done, you think about those things a little bit differently. But, um, you know, we'll, we'll just see how that goes. <clears throat> um, one more question. Out of curiosity, how many of you have never heard me give a talk before somewhere? Okay, a surprisingly large number of hands. That's really cool, actually, because it means we're getting new folks attending LCAs, because I realized just a few minutes ago I've been a speaker at every LCA since 2002. <laughs> um, for those of you who have heard me talk before, you're going to find this a little strange, um, because there are exactly zero gratuitous rocket photos in this talk. <laughs> Someone asked me about this at a Linux Foundation event that I was giving a Freedom Box talk at earlier this year, and I answered almost without thinking, yeah, well, that's because this is probably one of the few things in the world that I think is more important than rockets. And so um, I hope that you take that sort of in the spirit in which it's intended. Um, for those of you who haven't heard me talk before, I tell people I made my first personal contribution of source code to this thing we now call free software in about 1979. And uh, I'm probably best known in the free software world for my involvement in the Debian distribution project, though I've certainly been involved in lots of other things too. Um, in my day job, I am the chief technologist for open source and Linux at HP, and uh, I'm very pleased to have been able to uh, be part of uh, HP's relationship with LCA for lots of years now. Um, and on the side, I, I, you know, I remain very involved in the Debian project. I also serve as president of software in the public interest, and I'm a member of the board of directors of both the Linux Foundation, representing individual affiliates, um, and the Freedom Box Foundation. So, uh, what do I want to talk to you about today? Well, um, I thought I'd start with a suitably appropriate quote. Um, I don't know how much uh, those of you here in Australia study um, U.S. history and our founding fathers, but uh, Benjamin Franklin was a pretty big deal in a lot of ways. Um, not only was he sort of a printer and a scientist and all those sorts of things, but he left us with some great quotes. Um, this one, uh, they who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Yeah, and are likely to lose both in violence. Anyway, um, the general idea here is that I want you to be able to think consciously about the consequences of some of the choices that you make in your online life. Um, and to realize that for every time that you get some cool little feature or benefit or improvement in um, your social interactions online, that there are potentially some consequences that you probably don't currently think about, that I'd like you to think about, that might lead you over time to become um, far more interested uh, in the work that we're undertaking uh, here than you might uh, already be. So what's the problem? Well, uh, we've ended up in a world where more and more we are willing um, to put all sorts of personal data in the hands of companies who are running commercial cloud services um, to manage on our behalf. And, and in, you know, the reason we do that is that we get neat benefits as a consequence of that. But we don't really give a lot of thought to the consequences. And this is happening in a time when our personal lives are frankly under dramatically increasing scrutiny. So what's the real issue here? Well, every time that you upload a photo to Facebook, are you aware of the fact that they've now publicly admitted that they're part of the photo DNA system? And if you haven't heard about that, it's probably a good thing to stick into Google sometime. The short version is um, they are doing facial recognition on all the photos that are uploaded. Uh, the morally supportable motivation for this is to try and reduce uh, child exploitation on the net and to try and identify photos that are inappropriate and try to do something about those. Um, but this can become a problem when you realize that for-profit companies, no matter how noble the intentions are that they state in their terms of service have to operate 
within the rules and the, the legal environment of the jurisdictions in which they operate. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what happens if they get a court order saying, you know, help us identify the you know, recent interactions of such and such person who's on our most wanted list? You know, if you start to think about these uh, interactions and these consequences, what you realize is that we have, in the process of becoming enthusiastic about the new means of uh, communication that are available to us through uh, online social media, we are unconsciously and unwittingly surveilling each other. And every time you go and tag identities in a photo that somebody else uploaded uh, to a social media site, you are in effect making the job of somebody who might someday have reason to try and locate that individual much easier. And with all of the intersection, intersecting data sets that each of us sort of willfully contribute to, um, because it makes our lives easier, you know, our credit card information being stored on websites makes buying stuff from that site in the future easier, but you know, it also means that there's a much uh, richer set of data that can be mined to understand our preferences and our whereabouts. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on sort of all the things here that, that could go on, but I want you to realize that we are all of ourselves, uh, every one of you who raised your arm uh, as being uh, involved in, you know, participating in, being a subscriber to, or a user of any of those online services, are consciously or unconsciously making a decision that the benefit that you get from that service outweighs the potential negative consequences of this additional information about you and everyone else you ever interact with um, that becomes a part of uh, the online record uh, as a consequence. So this is the context in which my good friend Evan Moglen began to talk a couple of years ago about the need for us to think about the consequences of the amount of personal data that we were giving over control to other people of, and to start to think in terms of whether we could take some of the wonderful free software uh, elements and applications that we've built for each other and for ourselves over the years and package these in a way that um, mere mortals <coughs> could use to regain or to, to take more control of the data that is important to them personally so that they aren't always faced with this you know, tension and this decision between whether the benefit they get from uploading that photo to that site is really worth um, the negative consequence. So the vision that he articulated and I agreed to sign up and try and help turn into a reality is this notion that we could build personal servers running free software operating systems and applications specifically designed to create and preserve personal privacy. And that we would do this by putting the software on cheap, power efficient, plug computer servers that individuals could install in their own homes. Now there's a bunch of important stuff that's buried in this relatively brief description of vision. Um, part of it has to do with cheap. We'd like this to be accessible to a lot of people. Part of it has to do with the power efficiency issue. There are a lot of places in the world where power is not easily available and it's certainly not cheap. And the reason we care about a lot of those places is that they are places where um, people are presently um, and may in the future be putting themselves at great personal risk to fight for things that we think are incredibly important, like uh, their fundamental freedoms, and we'd like to be able to support that. Um, when we talk about in their own homes, at least in the United States, there is a fundamental legal distinction between things that are within your personal domicile and things that you have chosen to, to give away and put in some other place, such that if the data that we're talking about is something that resides on a server that you own that is housed within your house, then there's an entirely different set of legal protections for that than there is for the exact same data should you have chosen to upload it to some account that's um, operated on your behalf by somebody else. And you know, when we start talking about trying to uh, create and maintain personal privacy, those sorts of distinctions can become very important to us. In the process, we would like to think that what we're building could end up being a platform 
um, upon which people can build privacy respecting federated alternatives to contemporary social networks. And if that's too many big words all strung together, yes, I'm talking about things like di diaspora and some of its alternatives. Uh, one of the ones I'm personally the most interested in right now is Buddy Cloud and some of the things that are associated with it. Um, but in any case, um, this notion that we ought to be able to build secure, distributed, federated alternatives to this notion of having to sign up for a service run by one company on a bunch of servers in one data center that we don't control and might someday be you know, the subject of a search and seizure order, no matter how noble the intentions of the company in question. And then when we start thinking about small, low power devices and the idea of building you know, ad hoc networks and so forth, uh, one of the things that many people involved in the Freedom Box uh, effort are interested in is mesh networking. This notion that if we have a bunch of little low power servers that have wireless interfaces that can be made to mesh with each other, then we might have uh, solutions to everything from what happens when Egypt turns off the internet um, in order to keep their citizens from being able to communicate with each other and use uh, commercial social networking sites hosted elsewhere um, to be able to organize and, and uh, meet each other in the streets, uh, all the way to the other end of the spectrum where you know maybe the problem you've got is a net neutrality issue. Maybe your neighbor has a different ISP than you do, and if you agreed to collaborate with each other and share a little of each other's bandwidth in some kind of uh, you know private arrangement, uh, then you know the ability to you know route through them to get to sites that their ISP thinks is okay and yours doesn't and vice versa might end up being a wonderful way uh, to work around and break down some of these barriers that the commercial organizations selling us our connectivity seem to think are appropriate. Um, and then if we were successful at building something like this, then we would be in a position to help facilitate um, people who are fighting for freedoms that are much more fundamental and much more important um, than software freedom or internet freedom or whatever, uh, to be able to do so safely and securely with others um, by building social networks, supporting protest, demonstration, and mobilization uh, for political change. So one of the things that we made as a decision fairly early in this process uh, was to use Debian as the basis for all of the work that we're doing on Freedom Box. I suspect that here in this audience, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time explaining why Debian would be a good choice of a base platform to build something like Freedom Box on top of. But, you know, what it really comes down to on, on a simple level is that this is an organization that's quite international and has the same focus on freedom in everything uh, that's done uh, that the Freedom Box Foundation's principles believe is an important uh, sort of thing to base things on. And um, Debian supports all of the relevant hardware architectures that we're interested in at the moment already. And it is sort of a truism that because of the inclusive nature of the Debian project and the willingness to have sort of any software anybody's willing to support on behalf of the project become part of the main archive instead of having sort of separate ghettos for different um, contributed pa packages uh, that all free software does eventually seem to get packaged for Debian. And so if you want to build um, things like Freedom Boxes, it's a great place to go use as your base of technology. But then I sort of turn this around in the other direction too because the more we thought about it early this year after uh, forming the foundation, the more we realized that the world doesn't really need another distribution. It doesn't need a fork of an existing distribution. It certainly doesn't need another you know, mirror site somewhere that people have to decide to differentially trust above and beyond something else. And so what we're trying very hard to do is to make sure that all of the software that we use, if it isn't already part of the Debian distribution, gets packaged and incorporated into the distribution. So in the future, Debian stable releases could just have everything needed to be freedom boxes out of the box. And what this means is that as much as possible, we're building the Freedom Box using software that's already packaged for Debian. Anything that isn't, we will package and put into Debian. And the consequence of this that I think is really important is that regardless of how successful we are with our specific set of objectives, all of the work that we're doing will survive and be available and will to help and will help enhance 
the ability um, to do uh, privacy enabling and enhancing things with uh, Debian no matter where it is. Okay, so that's kind of what we're trying to do in some context around it. When uh, Eben uh, gave a keynote to open FOSDEM just shy of a year ago, one of the things he did was to announce the formation of a nonprofit U.S. corporation um, to try and pursue this vision and to turn it into some kind of, you know, reality which would uh, improve the lives of all of humanity that engages in connected communication. And that organization is called the Freedom Box Foundation. And as I say, it was founded by Evan Moglin. It has a three-member board of directors. I agreed very early to be a member of the board and to try and help uh, put forward this vision and turn it into some kind of a reality. The third member is Yakai Benkler, who is, uh, that name may or may not be familiar to many of you. He's a social scientist at, at Harvard University who's written all sorts of interesting things about uh, the consequences of uh, uh, the technology that we're bringing to bear and its changes on culture and society. So it's a good mix. We've got a legal expert, a technologist, and a social scientist. And uh, so far we managed to interact with each other just fine. Um, we, well, you know, it's, it's a heck of a bandwidth there. But, um, you know, the two of them are, are on the East Coast and I'm not. And, well, you know, whatever. Um, we appointed James Vasili, who's a, a, a lawyer working for Evan at the Software Freedom Law Center, who is immensely passionate about Freedom Box uh, to be the executive director. And of course he has the really tough job. He has to take stuff that's immensely boring and turn it into things that people get enthusiastic about. Um, and then one of the things I agreed to do uh, at Evan's request when I joined the board was to form a technical advisory committee and to chair that committee. I'll talk about its membership in just a moment. And then uh, more recently we've spun up a set of working groups um, that are trying to tackle various various uh, subject areas that we need to get additional thinking and clarity around as we move forward in trying to build a technology stack uh, to address the needs of, of uh, the Freedom Box uh, Foundation. So the work of the foundation, you know, I think the original vision that Evan had was that we'd put together, a, you know, what amounted to sort of a business plan or, or at least a, a roadmap and a sense of um, what could happen if we did the right things around this Freedom Box concept and that we would go find an angel investor or two and we'd hire some people and the technical advisory board would serve uh, as sort of an oversight organization to help the people who would be doing the work uh, make the right decisions and so forth. That's really not how it's turned out. It has turned uh, much more into a you know, free software kind of project, except that um, only sort of one piece of what the foundation needs to do is really amenable to free software project kinds of thinking and methodology, and that's the technology part. And so the development of the actual software stack for Freedom Box is now very much a community-driven free software kind of project. The other things that need to be done by the foundation, if we want to take software that you and I and essentially probably everybody here could figure out how to install and configure and make work on some piece of hardware that Debian can run on and turn that into something that my mother could go buy at retail, plug in and have some kind of assurance of you know, functional enhancement of her privacy with, then we have to work on user experience. And this is one of the places where, uh, unfortunately, we've had sort of the least progress to report so far. And the reason for that is the intersection of people who are competent user interface and user experience designers and people who are willing to work for free is pretty small. And if any of you know of people who would enthusiastically like to dive in and help us work on user experience around what I'm going to be describing through the rest of this talk, please get in touch with me. Another pillar is publicity and fundraising. You know, <coughs> this is all about making sure that people know what we're doing and are able to participate in the process in ways that um, they would like to be able to. And then industry relations is the euphemism for dealing with hardware vendors. And the reason this is so important is that every producer of ARM-based system-on-chips on the planet 
is has on their roadmap something that might be interesting um, for you know future freedom boxes. The problem is most of them don't want to talk about anything that isn't released yet without going under non-disclosure agreements. And it's just not fair to take random free software developers and expect them to be willing to sign their lives away like that in order to know what's going on. So one of the roles that uh, the sort of folks at the core of the foundation play is to be willing and able to engage in those kinds of communications to get some idea of where things are going, to be able to influence the thinking of the system on chip and device vendors that we're interested in working with in the future um, in a way that doesn't entangle the rest of the technologists that are trying to work on the project. And so those are the four sort of fundamental pillars of activity at the foundation. And the only one of these that really gets any time from people who are being paid to work on it right now is the publicity and fundraising and to a lesser extent the industry, industry relations parts. All the rest is being done by volunteers. So the technical advisory committee that I put together currently consists of six people. My suspicion is that all of you recognize at least one of those names other than mine, but you may not know all of them. Um, if you don't know Jacob Applebaum, then make sure you're here on Friday morning for the keynote. <coughs> always worth listening to and thought-provoking in a lot of ways. Um, Jacob's probably best known for his involvement in the Tor project, but he has very strong interest in uh, privacy and particularly uh, anonymity in uh, the internet. Um, and I have no idea what he's going to talk about on Friday. Hopefully between now and then he'll figure it out. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be worth listening to. Uh, Sam Hartman, is that's a name many of you may recognize from either the Debian or the Kerberos world. Uh, he He's a, a, a real expert in the area of computer security. Um, Sasha Meinrath is um, from the New America Foundation, very involved in the mesh networking world and is sort of our expert on mesh technologies. Uh, Rob Savoy is one of the early employees at Cygnus Solutions and has been a you know, contributor to many GNU projects over the years. Uh, he's certainly been here at LCA at, at various times in the past. Uh, the principal developer behind the Ganache project um, for a while and a very close personal friend, very pleased to have his involvement. And Matt Zimmerman and of course, um, is probably best known for his historical role in the Debian project and then for serving as CTO at Canonical for quite a while. Um, he's now off and, and uh, working in a different space on the Locker project, which of course has some interesting potential intersections with some of what we've been talking about. So this is a great group of people, but if you know any of us, one of the things you'll know is that we're all immensely busy people. And each of these folks was more than happy to sign up to be part of an advisory board, but that doesn't mean that you know they're all spending huge amounts of time actually trying to do technical work. And so lots of the things that we'd like to work on are still sort of constrained by available resource, and there are lots of opportunities to help if you would be motivated in trying to help. Uh, some of the working groups that have been spun up, there's a list of them here. I'll point to just a couple of them that I think uh, have made some real uh, progress recently. The Promotion and Visual Identity group has come up with a much sexier logo than the one I have on these slides, and hopefully by the time I give this talk again in a few weeks, uh, I'll have an opportunity to get with them and, and freshen to use their new identity stuff. Um, and then there's been quite a bit of work um, recently on sort of the peer model and on this model of identity, which I'll talk about in a little bit. There are some things that I don't think we anticipated that we'd have to do that the foundation has had to work on behind the scenes. And those of you who've asked me this week, sort of, you know, how are things going with Freedom Box, one of the things I've had to say is, well, you know, we're making progress, but we've suffered, you know, a few months of sort of delay of game. And part of this has to do with the fact that when the foundation got started, we ran a Kickstarter campaign to raise some initial seed capital to do things like go through the registration of the corporation and begin the nonprofit uh, foundation setup process. Um, and when we did that, that Kickstarter campaign at certain levels um, committed to the delivery of certain premiums to the, the contributors. And at a couple of those levels, that was a plug server with some software pre-installed that, you know, would be something like a Freedom Box. And um, so early in uh, the year, um, the team that works for Evan evaluated uh, the available plug servers and selected um, uh, 
the um, global scale dream plug as our initial target platform to use for this and at that time it really was um, the best in class device available for what we wanted to do it had a great set of features which I'll talk about in a couple minutes uh, unfortunately it had a few GPL violations buried in it and as you might imagine <coughs> working on a project where Evan Moglen is one of the principals in the guiding light, um, one does not ship anything that has a GPL violation. In fact, uh, one sort of drops everything else and works on resolving the GPL violation before you do anything else. Uh, we have pleasantly been able to get the attention of and the response from both Marvell and Global Scale to the issues that drove us nuts initially. Uh, they did release the source code to the user space utilities required for interacting with the wire wireless chipset that's um, part of this device. The modifications Global Scale had made to the bootloader were eventually released and have now been fully merged and are part of U-Boot upstream. You can now build a DreamPlug U-Boot uh, instance from the U-Boot uh, package that's in Debian. That's just an amazing transition. And um, the kernel patch set that we finally extracted from them uh, turned out to have uh, less stuff uh, remaining as deltas that needed to be merged upstream than we had feared but it was still a non-zero set. And the only real remaining frustration, and this is something that won't go away on this device, unfortunately, is that the micro AP, which is this, you know, super whizzy uh, wireless device, very similar but a different model to the one that was in the original OLPC machines, um, has a big binary firmware blob that you pretty much have to use to do fun things. Um, it's possible to use a, a, a free software driver uh, in the kernel if all you want to do is be a wireless client. But if you want to serve as an access point, you need both a um, a, a kernel tainting driver and a binary firmware blob that's non-trivial. Um, I wish there were some way for us to get around that. If we were going to stick on this particular hardware design forever, we would probably work harder at reverse engineering and trying to hack around that. But quite honestly, I hope that this isn't the platform that we spend the rest of our lives dealing with. And as a consequence, there's a knee in the curve somewhere, and I think we've reached it where uh, sort of everything that we can get to be free is free. And, you know, we're going to deal with that binary blob for a while, which I just find really frustrating. So let me talk a little bit about this hardware that we chose. Um, the initial hardware target, as I said, is the Dream Plug from Global Scale Technologies. And just to give you a sense of what that's like, uh, this is one. Um, it's a cute little server. They call them plug servers because you can pop this... Um, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was kind of a launch, wasn't it? Um, this is the little adapter that lets you put a power cord in if, like me, you kind of like to not have it hanging right on the outlet. But you can slide in little adapters that will plug into all the different kinds of uh, physical power plugs around the world. And then that's actually the power supply part of it. And this is the server. And um, it's actually pretty cute. And it takes 5 volts in it, you know. Um, some number of milliamps and um, gives you a really f uh, capable set of features. Um, it runs the Marvell Kirkwood um, processor, which is an ARM system on chip, single core, 1.2 gigahertz. It's got a half gig of RAM and a couple of megabytes of spy or flash that's used for the bootloader. Um, they come with a, an internal micro SD card slot that intriguingly enough is a USB peripheral. Um, and so uh, with the two gigabyte card that comes with them by default, you can do a very credible job of putting the root file system and the basic software stack internally. And then there's several external interfaces, including a couple of USB 2s and an eSATA and an SD socket that you can use for you know, plugging in various data storage devices. It has two gigabit ethernets. Um, having two wired network interfaces is of course important if you want to inject this as sort of a router or filter or some kind of a firewalling element into a network somewhere. Um, the fact that they're gigabit, I'm not sure how important that really is. Um, because frankly, there's this tension where if you load the gigabit driver, the power consumption is just amazingly higher than if you load the 100 megabit driver that also works with the hardware. Um, so I, there's all sorts of discussion you could have about exactly how you expect these to be deployed topologically that would lead you to understand what the right trade-offs are. There's a Bluetooth interface, there's an audio interface, 
Um, and then this uh, 802.11bg interface using the Marvel microaxis point. For those of you who couldn't see it very well up here, uh, that's what one looks like with the cute little artist rendition of what a sexy sticker might look like on it. Um, right. <laughs> there are other interesting hardware targets though, and part of the reason, as I mentioned earlier, we thought it was so important to try and use Debian and stay close to it is that it means that, you know, on some level, anything that can run Debian can be a freedom box. And I think that's immensely important and powerful because it turns out that there are parts of the world where no matter how cheap you make some specific piece of hardware, um, people are going to want to source things locally, maybe cast off PCs or whatever, and put those to use. And you know, you'd like for all of the good work that you do on building applications and protocols um, to be applicable regardless of what people have access to. But there are some other plug servers that are worthy of note. The Shiva plug was sort of the predecessor to the Dream plug. It only has one wired network interface, but otherwise its specs are quite similar. Um, it has a different internal flash, but the same amount of RAM, same Kirkwood processor, the same clock rate as the Dream Plug. One thing I really like about it as a developer is it has an integrated JTAG interface. There's a mini USB connector that you plug into, and kaboom, you've got serial console and JTAG. On the Dream Plug, that's a separate little dongle with some you know, wiggy little Asian fine pitch cables to go over to the device. I think that allowed them to do the JTAG and serial console interface once and make a gazillion of them and then ship them with different kinds of plugs. But as a developer and frankly as a person deploying sort of early versions of these, um, I would have much rather had that fully integrated and be guaranteed that I couldn't brick a device in the field, but that's life. Um, there's another plug that I just got my hands on one of called the Tenito plug. Uh, it also only has a single um, wired network interface in addition to a, a wireless interface, but it has internal support for two and a half inch SATA drive, which is sort of the standard drive these days in notebooks. And that means that if what you're really after is, you know, being able to drop a data serving uh, object on the net somewhere, that's a very interesting device. It uses a different ARM flavor. I forget offhand which one it is. Um, but it also has very good uh, Linux support, and I don't anticipate any bigger problems supporting it than supporting the Shiva and, and Dream plugs. There are also a bunch of set-top ARM boxes out there now. There are developer boards. Things like the Beagle and Panda boards actually have a pretty reasonable hardware complement for, um, for the kind of applications we'd like to put them to. Um, and there are a number of people who are now interested in the possibility of doing some specifically targeted hardware that would you know, have 100% uh, free software all the way up and down, including things like the wireless firmware. Um, and you know, I would love to see that come to fruition, but uh, right now, today, we're sort of you know, in this mode of using what we have available. Okay, so we have this foundation in place. The foundation, among other things, picked this initial unit of hardware first to target. What's actually happened? Sort of what, what have we done with code? Well, um, we had this wonderful time in Banja Luka last Northern Hemisphere summer. The Debian Developers Conference was hosted in Bosnia this year. Um, and enough people who were passionate about Freedom Box managed to come together in one place that we actually got a lot of stuff done. First of all, um, DebConf 11 had a lot of talks that have content that's relevant to Freedom Box. Um, DKG gave some interesting talks on you know, crypto. There, there are just a number of talks. If you haven't gone and looked and you have time, uh, go find the DebConf 11 video site and peruse the list of presentations and you may find some really interesting talks whether you're a Debian head or not. Um, the second thing is that at the time of that uh, conference in Banja Luka, we had just relieved, received the source code to the user space utilities for this Marvell microaxis point wireless chip. Part of the problem with this chip, by the way, is if you want to use it as an access point, you need to use their binary driver and its associated um, big firmware blob. And part of the challenge with that is it doesn't use the normal kernel wireless services. And so in order to be able to do things like set the SSID on the access point and to tweak other uh, configuration parameters and to monitor uh, activity that's out there, you need these separate user space utilities. 
facilities. And they had been made available um, as binary only um, applications on all of the previous uh, loads for any of Global Scale's plug servers that had ever been shipped. And I'm really pleased that Evan and his team were able to convince Global Scale to not only give us the source code to those, or excuse me, Marvell, to give us the source code to those, but they released it under GPL. And so we have those utilities now. So while they still depend on a driver that we hate, <coughs> At least all the user space stuff is now available to us and can be hacked and integrated in, in other ways that are useful. <coughs> um, we sp we've spent a lot of time working on tools for building the reference implementation. Part of the problem here is that we, when you start building images for embedded devices, everybody sort of has a tool set. Uh, certainly our friends at Canonical have a very rich tool set for building sort of pre-configured images that can be put on all sorts of devices. There are lots of people that have tool sets. And all of them are sort of bigger, heavier, and more complicated to figure out than any of us wanted to deal with. So uh, in the end, in that week in Banya Luka, um, a surprisingly small amount of shell script was to use to, to solve the problem. And what we came out with is a tool that that I sort of branded Freedom Maker, and there is a repo up on the Debian Alioth server, which unfortunately the last time I looked was down, um, that has all of the source to what we've been doing there. It is back up. Excellent. Glad to hear that. It had a weird problem with the server that just wouldn't boot, and that was just sort of strange. Um, there was also a bunch of work done on U-Boot during that week. The interesting thing is it wasn't actually being done by people at DevConf. Um, when folks in the larger world heard that we were all sort of hacking together trying to make some Freedom Box things happen, one of the upstream the folks who was more upstream than we were on U-Boot jumped in and volunteered to, to work with the source code we had just gotten access to for um, Global Scale's build of, of U-Boot for the Dream Plug, and that's all now, as I said, been integrated. It was an excellent piece of work. We spent a lot of time figuring out how to do Debian packaged kernels for the Dream Plug. And part of the problem was at that time, um, this was in the middle of sort of the kernel development community's um, negative reaction to the chaos in the ARM tree. Uh, with all the different ARM SOCs having sort of their own little, you know, branches. And uh, as a consequence, it was a really bad time to be asking for things like a new device ID to be added to the tree. And um, nonetheless, uh, we did the analysis and realized that there was actually less delta remaining um, between the 3.0 uh, kernel sources that we were looking at at that time um, and what we needed to work on the Dream Plug. And since then, almost, not quite, but almost everything we need has been folded in upstream and is now part of the Debian kernel stuff. So we are certainly at this point very close and by the time of the next Debian stable release we'll certainly have gotten to the point where we can have a pre-built Kirkwood image um, in Debian that works on all of the plugs that we care about. Another piece of excellent work to have accomplished. There's a lot of discussion about and work towards uh, you know, what applications it would make sense to include in initial images. If you go out and look at the Freedom box web uh, wiki pages that are in the sort of Debian half of the sphere, there are a lot of pages, excuse me, there are a lot of applications that have been identified that people would love to be able to have on something like a Freedom Box. And at the end of the day, there's only so many that you can actually have. And so there's been a lot of winnowing of all of that and lots of things. I mentioned the video replays that are available. So since then, um, we got the Dream Plug kernel packaging stuff done. Um, kudos to, to Hector Oron, aka Zumbi, for, for doing a lot of the work on that. Um, we're using Freedom Maker, we've dropped a couple of developer releases. I have to be completely clear and tell you that these are sort of Debian OS images for the Dream Plug, not really Freedom Box images so far, which is why we tag them as developer releases. Um, but the most recent one of those met the needs that uh, the folks at the foundation had for being able to ship out hardware to the folks in the Kickstarter uh, campaign who were expecting it, so that was a really big deal to, to cross. 
lots of ongoing discussions with industry partners. Uh, back in October, I managed to carve out two days from my schedule to spend in New York. Uh, we had a very intense set of meetings, and a couple of things that came out of that were a solidification of the plans for how we might use GPG keys as the root of identity and uh, trust relationships between devices. Um, seems like sort of an obviously good idea, but there are all sorts of interesting challenges that come as a consequence of that. We also realized that um, our initial thoughts about sort of what we had to have in the way of useful applications before we'd have an image that was worth dropping were maybe too complicated and ambitious, that um, some fairly simple SSH tricks to enable people to help their friends in weird parts of the world get tunneled connections to other parts of the world um, could be very handy, um, and that in fact doing a Clueful Privoxy installation could allow people to gain uh, quite a bit more um, privacy in their you know, general web surfing using other clients that might be behind a device like this. Um, and I'm very pleased that in the last week, uh, James Basil has released a, a proposed Privoxy configuration, and those of you who are interested in and more knowledgeable about that than I am, I would love to have you take a look at what he's done and give us feedback on that. So going forward from him, uh, from here, one of the things that I think we would like to do is to figure out how to build some x86 virtual images that people can play with even if they don't have access to some plug server hardware. Uh, there has been some work done by a couple of contributors in the project and we just need to get around to folding that into Freedom Maker and we'll be all good. Um, one of the things James did was to write a very lightweight Python-based framework uh, for user interfaces um, so that we don't have to have huge bodies of code in order to be able to have uh, you know, some web-oriented simple user interface for configuring and administering the box, and, and that project's called Plinth. Um, we're just starting to get that integrated and to flesh it in some. Um, in order to be able to use SSH keys as a root of trust for accessing your local Freedom Box. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of issues you have to deal with here. How does my Freedom Box know that's me trying to talk to it and to give me the right um, authorization to be able to configure and administer it? On the flip side, how do I know for sure that I'm actually talking to my Freedom Box and not being man in the middle attacked in some way? Um, before you even start to talk about how the different devices know who each other are and to be able to build larger network relationships. Um, there is a tool set that if you don't know about it, you ought to learn about called Monkey Sphere that allows you to do things like control SSH access based on um, uh, GPG keys or open PGP keys. And we would very much like uh, to come up with an auth module for Apache that can hook into the Monkey Sphere daemon so that we can gate access to uh, web-based services and an administrative interface um, on the basis of uh, presence of certain GPG key attributes. Um, this is sort of turning the Apache auth model that's really all about um, you know, the CA cabal on its side. And so uh, some of you who are more familiar with that infrastructure may immediately sort of know how to do that. Um, it's more of a challenge for me to wrap my brain around. And then one of the things that we think would be a really useful thing to deliver soon is a sort of single node secure SMPP chat stack. Because if we had that, plus a privoxy config, plus some you know, user interface to make some interesting SSH tunneling tricks easier, we think that would actually be a pretty useful initial feature release. And so we hope to drop sort of periodic releases until we hit something that we can declare as a 1.0. One more thing that I'll mention sort of in passing before I start to wrap up is that in the process of thinking about this, um, we just keep sort of finding ourselves having our brains expand a little bit and then having to pull back in so that we're not trying to blot out the sun. But one of the things we've realized is that there's a real challenge associated with how people initially establish trust relationships with each other. And one of the cool ideas that somebody came up with, and uh, it's actually Stefano Mafoul and he's been chasing this, is this notion that since we all have cell phones with cameras on them, you know, now maybe we could use QR codes representing the fingerprints of keys the, so that when we meet somebody in person, we have a quick way to exchange a credential which could then be synced with our freedom boxes to help them understand that that other person is somebody we know and might be interested in establishing some kind of a trust relationship with. So how can you help? Prevent the disclosure of that right away. 
Um, it's been published in a bunch of places, um, so we'll see whether that's actually adequate or not. Um, okay, so how can you help? First thing, please try to be conscious about privacy issues and the other freedoms that matter to you and all of the things that you do. A simple thing on this is, do you have a GPG key yet? If you don't, um, establishing one, taking advantage of the peer network that you have here at LCA to get some credible signatures so that you can be hooked into the World Wide Web of Trust would be a great thing to do. Feel free to see me if you'd like to have uh, a key signing with somebody who is pretty well connected. Um, <coughs> And when I'm talking about privacy, I hope you understand, I'm talking about that tension between the things that you get as benefits from participating in all sorts of online activities and the potential consequences that you may not have thought about. Please experiment with software and help us refine the list of alternatives to existing cloud services that are referenced at that URL. Um, if you've got time and interest, join one of our working groups. Help us select Debian packages and determine the configurations that you know, would help us deliver uh, functionality uh, to meet our vision. And then I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Freedom Box is a nonprofit foundation and your financial contributions would always be welcome. So with that, thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope this has been interesting and I'll be happy to take questions until we run out of time. So with potential applications for the Freedom Box, uh, is it necessary to rework a lot of the user interfaces? So taking the uh, XMPP chat stack as an example, um, a lot of the XMPP servers come with a nice interface, like uh, I think ProCity has a nice one, um, and that works quite well with BodyCloud. Uh, would they want to put a, another management interface that's more integrated, or if the standard interface was up to scratch? So the interface that I'm really interested in working on the short term is the administrative interface where you might do something like have simple switches to decide is this Freedom Box going to deliver an XMPP chat service or not. Not so much that I want to change Prosody or JW chats interfaces if that ended up being the pair of you know, pieces of software that we use to actually deliver that. And I, you know, if I have my way, that's what it'll be. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I'm very interested in Buddy Cloud. I will freely admit that I just haven't had enough personal time to dive in and understand it well enough to be able to make good technical decisions around it right now. But other folks within the project have. Maybe you, maybe other folks yeah, here know much more than I do. It's a little bit so. young at the moment, but there's a beta version that you can sort of log in and, you know, have a look around. Um, Right, so anyway, um, you know, people give me a hard time sometimes about saying I'd like to build this as much as possible with existing software, and then the things I get excited about are the things that aren't quite baked yet. But this is just the classic tension, right? And my objective would be to you know, get to the point where we're delivering a usable feature set that helps to actually improve you know, the average person's uh, ability to create and maintain personal privacy soon and then expand out from there to you know, more interesting services. I think all of you understand though that there is a fundamental tension here. The more you want to communicate and the more you want to interact with other people, sort of the larger that bubble gets, the harder it is to maintain you know, privacy, much less anonymity. Um, different people have different opinions about how hard or how easy different parts of that problem space are to resolve. But, uh, you know, the key is it's hard and there's a lot of work and if we want to make this something that average people can use without, you know, putting themselves at immense risk, we need to be fairly careful to make sure that we don't end up with user interfaces that, you know, drive people nuts and lead them astray. I think it's not just your privacy, but your friend's privacy at stake as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think we're all going to realize eventually that we have a social responsibility to everybody in our social networks, and we'll see. Other questions? Julian? Yeah. I'll leave the um, software questions aside because I'm biased there, obviously. But my day job, I manage one of the largest global networks and I see the scale of the internet as it is today and having worked previously with Melbourne Mars and similar groups on metropolitan mesh type wireless networks, I 
I wonder how useful that can truly be. So I'm personally not a big mesh person, and I don't mean that I'm negative about it, I just mean that of all the possible things I could go learn about and become an expert on, that's not one I've tackled. And so the consequence of this is I can only think about this and talk about it at a certain level of abstraction. But what's absolutely clear to me is that within the Freedom Box community, there is an immense tension between people who want to take advantage of as much existing infrastructure as possible, adding sort of an additional shim layer of protection in the activities that we engage in, and then at the other side, a group of people who believe that any dependencies we build on anything that we don't control is bad and a mistake and we just shouldn't do that. And that goes all the way from what makes you think DNS is going to work tomorrow? And this is before we heard about SOPA. <coughs> okay. Um, to huge, intense concern over the CA cartel, the folks who you know, are responsible for all of the certificates that we use to decide whether that's really the website we think we're talking to or not. You know, that is a centrally controlled, you know, so there's several places that do this, but what is it that makes the particular set of CA certificates that are shipped with the browser that you get on your favorite Linux distribution things you should trust? Good question. And so there's this huge tension already between taking advantage of what's there and using it as much as possible and we ought to sort of reinvent the world from sand and go from there. I'm somewhere in, in between. I don't want to build structural dependencies on things that might fail in the near term. But at the same time, I don't want to wait until we you know, start from sand and build everything from scratch to be able to deliver some utility at a moment in history where we're seeing people all over the world putting themselves at immense personal risk because of the intersection of the kinds of services they feel they need to use and the kinds of activities they're trying to engage in which might lead the jurisdiction that they're in to decide to go serve a search warrant on the service provider that they're using to foment revolution. So is that a good answer? No. Um, <coughs> At the end of the day, I think Mesh is an example of a technology we'd like to be able to enable. We'd like to be able to use it to augment existing connections. I don't really see the goal of the Freedom Box project as being to sort of replace the whole world, you know, with something completely different. There are certainly people out there who are much more interested in you know, focusing on the mesh piece and driving that to conclusion than we are. Over time, I hope we have you know, the opportunity to collaborate with all of those other projects so that the net result is you know, good for everybody. Do we have time for more or are we out? Okay, we have time for one very last quick question. So anyone got a quick one? All the way out the back. <laughs> yep, there's always one in the back. Good man! And of course, before she, before she even gets the mic to you, I'll make it clear that I'm going to be here you know, until the end of the conference. So please feel free to grab me in the hall or outside. Don't be afraid to approach me if there's a question you've got or you'd like to talk about something. or Particularly if you'd like to volunteer to work on something. That would be just awesome. Okay, you got the mic? Hi. Um, sorry, more of a comment than a question. That's quite fine. Um, you're saying one of the reasons is that with the best will in the world, uh, a company can be essentially ordered by their government to um, that data, which is certainly a threat and a very big one in some parts of the world. I think sometimes people focus on that threat more than they should because there's certainly other more mundane ones. One is obviously that the company is more evil than you thought. One is that the next owners are more evil than you thought. But the other one is that an individual employee or somebody who has physical access to the premises um, undermines them despite whatever policies are in place to try to stop that. And another one is that an individual authority figure, a policeman or something, claims to have ordered to release data whether or not they actually have the legal authority to do that. And those are all other threats that are, are real and, and, and in many cases more real than, than sort of government Direct government yes, adventure. absolutely. You're absolutely right. And 
you know, the problem in any finite length presentation is you sort of have to pick and choose what to talk about and what to point to. Um, to me, the good thing is that almost all of those concerns are things that you would choose to address with a relatively similar sort of set of technical responses and, and policy responses. And so to me, what this is really all about is trying to help ensure that the technology that many of us have worked on and have figured out how to use for ourselves to ensure some modicum of privacy and, and you know, uh, for some people, anonymity is more important. I, you know, wh whatever. The things that we have all collaborated on putting together are accessible to a broader set of people than just the folks who initially developed them. Uh, you know, it, it unfortunately is sort of a tautology that, you know, the user interfaces to lots of this stuff are really harsh. And uh, there's no reason that it needs to be that way. But on the other hand, I don't really sort of want you to think about the Freedom Box project as just being about, you know, putting glitzy user interfaces on things. Um, but frankly, at the end of the day, you know, a big part of this really is about how do we make technologies like uh, having all of your internet traffic be encrypted and as appropriate anonymized uh, on a regular basis without the kind of frustration, challenge, and pain that you know some of us have had to go through to make those things work for ourselves. So that's kind of what it's all about. Um, hopefully, as we go forward, there will be lots more progress. I would love to be able to come back a year from now or something and, you know, if not, hand out to all of you a cool little box that will help improve your privacy, at least be in a position to tell you where to go buy one. And, um, of course, you know, one of the challenges here, and part of the reason we're having so much interaction with hardware vendors, both at the silicon and device level, is that if you really want to change the world, you've got to get to the point where this is something somebody can go buy at retail. And that just leads to an entirely different set of requirements and expectations beyond anything we've already talked about here today. But Okay. Um, you know, this is one of those things where, depending on how you think about it, you can either end up deciding that the only solution is to slit your throat, or, <coughs> as I have, you can buckle down and say, okay, this is a problem. This is the kind of thing that we can factor and figure out how to tackle and do something good for, for the world with, and I hope you'll join me in helping to do that. Thank you very much.